caring after an affair. Listen, infidelity is one of the most devastating things that a couple can go through. It affects everything in the relationship and it affects everything inside each partner. Our emotions, our connection, our confidence in ourself, all of our shame comes up. You know, it can devastate each of you individually and obviously cause the relationship to rupture. But what I'm going to focus on in this video is not only why infidelity happens and hint, it's not about sex most of the time, but also what you can do to repair after an affair, because here's the good news. While infidelity is devastating for each of you, and especially for the one that's been cheated on, it actually can be a doorway to a better relationship than you ever could have imagined. That's the crazy part because the affair and the betrayal and everything that comes with that actually can be a doorway. And if both of you are willing to do the work that it takes to get the relationship back on track and to repair what's been broken, you can end up with a more communicative, more connected, more passionate relationship than you ever would have had if the affair hadn't happened. And I've seen it happen time and time again. Let me just start by saying, if there has been infidelity, the number one thing to think about and to know is that you must have support. It is next to impossible to repair after an affair without the support of a trained clinician who understands infidelity, who helps couples repair, because this is too big, it affects everything. It affects your sense of worth. It affects your sense of safety. You have to go through a grieving process when infidelity happens. Each of you do, not just the one that was cheated on, right? The one that was cheated on of loss, loss of who they thought they were, you know, in a monogamous relationship with, what they thought their future was, who they thought they were together, their own sense of self and confidence in themselves and their confidence in their own sniffer, right? Their own compass. How did I not see? That, in fact, is the hardest thing. Uh, that's sort of, a, in my experience, one of the final stages is getting back that confidence in yourself that you won't be bamboozled again, right? That's one of the hardest things about infidelity for the person that was cheated on. But the tricky part is that the person who cheated often has to go through a grieving process too if you're gonna repair after the affair because I'm gonna be getting into it in a minute what's required to repair after an affair. But one of the things that's required is to cut off all contact with the person who you had the affair with. No more contact of any sort. And so, especially if the affair went on for some time or if that person was really fulfilling a deep need and the person who was cheating, even though they may not want to be with that person anymore and they're ready and wanting to repair things with their with their partner, it is still a loss for them too. And they're also facing the gr same kind of grief that the person that was cheated on. The, the relationship feels ruptured. They're feeling a tremendous amount of shame and anxiety. They're seeing the disgust and disdain and anger in their partner's eyes, and they're having to face that. And that's painful, right? So both of you are going through pain. And even if one of you cheated and the other one is a beautiful, perfect person and partner, although let's face it, none of us are perfect. Each of you have 100% in the relationship. That does not mean that it is your fault if you got cheated on by any means. But it does mean that the nature of the relationship, each of you have your 100% responsibility. You, this is part of your dance together, okay? Now that doesn't mean that you drove your partner to cheat or it's your fault that your partner cheated, but if you wanna repair the relationship, that is the foundation. Both of you have to be willing to take responsibility for your own stuff that you bring to the table and for your own part that you had to play and where you are now. Even if it is that you stuck your head in the sand as the one that was cheated on, that you didn't see the signs or that you know there were aspects in the relationship that weren't supportive and that maybe made the relationship more vulnerable to cheating. 
right? So some of that has to be addressed too. But the main thing is that each of you have to be willing to do the work it takes. Each of you have to be willing to look in the mirror and each of you have to be willing to step up out of your comfort zone in order for this to work. Okay, let's talk about why people cheat. The reason people cheat, honestly, rarely has anything to do with sex. Now, the rare, the exception to that is if one of you has a really significant, healthy sex drive and the other one is completely shut down sexually and has been completely unavailable uh, that, you know, over an extended period of time, I'm not talking a couple of months, right? I'm talking about years, then yes, in some cases, infidelity is a result of not getting your sexual needs met. But I can tell you as someone who's been doing this for decades, the majority of the time, the reason the person is cheated has nothing to do with sex. It's that they're looking for validation. They feel empty inside. They're dealing with anxiety or stress that they don't know how to deal with. So they're looking for a distraction. Um, they're looking for a sense of worthiness outside themselves. And most obviously all of this is unconscious, but when this other person comes in who is feeding their ego and making them feel like they're the greatest thing since sliced bread and, and the excitement and the titillation of that, the chase and of the taboo and of the secrecy that gives a charge, it gives an adrenaline bump. It's almost, it becomes almost like a drug. And so usually when someone is cheating, it's those things. They're looking for a way to kind of fill themselves up, to feel better about themselves, to feel validated, to feel a charge that they can't create inside themselves or to distract themselves from what they can't be with about themselves. So that's really important to know because part of the healing is understanding why the infidelity happened, what need was being met or needs were being met by that relationship or that infidelity, because that's often the source of where the healing is found. Now, how do you repair? Okay. Like I said, you definitely need a guide and an ally who is there for both of you. Sometimes that person will suggest that each of you have individual work as well, especially if there were significant issues that are, you know, of self-worth or anxiety or inability, you know, lack of emotional intelligence, those things often need more intense, in-depth work with an individual therapist in conjunction with a couple's therapist, okay? But in general, here's how you repair after an affair. Like I said before, number one, no more contact with the affair. It is completely cut off, okay? There is no communication of any sort and you make that promise and you make a commitment to tell your partner if any attempt by the affair of contact was made. So if that person reaches out to you or tries to reach out to you directly or through another person or indirectly, you not only deny contact, you immediately let your partner know. This is one of the keys because you have to, one of the big, big, big things here is not only rebuilding the relationship, but you have to rebuild trust in order to rebuild the relationship. And in my experience, it works best to do both at the same time. So the person who cheated, one of the hardest things is that you have to be willing to be an open book. All of your passwords are shared. All of your accounts, email accounts and social media and everything else is shared. You are an open book because there is nothing else to hide. So your partner can check up on you, can look into your emails, knows all of your passwords and you have to be willing to put up with that lack of privacy. You also, as the person who cheated, have to be willing to be where you say you're gonna be, do what you say you're gonna do, be impeccable with your word, okay? So that your partner can start to trust that you are where you say you're going and that they can trust that what you're saying is true. And you know, depending on how long and how insidious the affair was, like if you had a one night stand one time, that's very different than if you had you know, a five year close love relationship affair, right? And there was all of these times that you were duplicitous and that you lied and got away with it. Obviously in that second case, it's gonna take a much longer time for your partner to believe and to trust in your word again, right? So you have to be patient and it may take time for your partner to 
start trusting you again. At the same time, if your partner is someone who has been cheated on before in other relationships or grew up around a lot of infidelity and doesn't really trust love, it will also take them longer to trust you. And that is also a case where that partner may need some added individual work to work through their past traumas of betrayal in order to really move through this process effectively with you. The other thing that's important for repairing after an affair is balancing the need to process the pain together and the need to start building healthy connection again. Because this is one of the trickiest things I find in repairing after the affair. So this is for the person who's been cheated on, right? You're obsessing. Oh, that time you told me you were with your mother, were you really with him or her? Or that time you said you were going to this business meeting, were you really with them? You know, your mind is going 24 seven and you're peppering the per person with anger and accusations and grief and fury and questions right? And that's, that's normal to have that impulse. But if you want to repair the relationship, then you have to be willing to contain that and ideally create a one to five ratio between those negative exchanges and positive ones at the very minimum, peaceful ones. Okay. So what do I mean by that? My prescription typically, I mean, every case is different, but just in general, is that you get, as the one who is cheated on, 30 minutes a day, maximum, to throw those emotional darts, ask a million questions. There's a caveat to the questions I'll get to in a second, but ask a million questions, make a million accusations, be angry, all of those things, 30 minutes a day. You can take that 30 minutes when you need it all at once or parse it out, but the rest of the time, okay? So we're talking about another two and a half hours minimum a day, one to five ratio, you need to be spending time enjoying each other as best you can. Even if at first that's just peaceful, taking a walk together, watching a movie together, um, Eventually, you know, hopefully being intimate together, having fun together, doing something playful together. Because remember, both of you are grieving, including that person who cheated, right? So think of the long game. You want to repair the relationship. So they've lost the person they were that was meeting that need, whatever that need was. And they're spending time with you, or most of the time, unless you implement what I'm talking about, you're angry at them or you're minimizing them or you're, or you're throwing those emotional darts or you're telling them how horrible they are and they're lonely and sad and they are hopeless, right? Both of you feel hopeless. So as you start seeking those opportunities to connect with one another and have fun together and, and do things that you enjoy together that are pleasant and fulfilling and maybe even intimate eventually, that really starts to fortify the relationship. So that honestly, the hardest one who, you know, the person who has the hardest time with that is the one that was cheated on, right? To contain your emotional dart throwing to 30 minutes max a day. And by the way, if you only have two hours a day, then only one fifth of those two hours is spent throwing those emotional darts, right? So I'm assuming you have at least three hours a day together when I talk about my 30 minutes. Now, the other piece, as I said, about asking the questions, I promise you, it does not serve you to ask questions about the sex. As, you can ask questions about the lies. You can ask questions about the relationship. Do not ask specific sexual questions. I have found time and every single time that it is next to impossible to move beyond those facts. And when you start then getting intimate again, or maybe you've been intimate the whole time physically, it's next to impossible to get those images out of your mind in the moment. And it creates insecurities. It, 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 there's something about the sexual knowledge of what happened and what you did together and what positions you were in and how you did it that is not only unnecessary for your healing, but it does damage. 
So that is my one caveat about the questions that you can ask. It does not serve you. Now, if you want to ask about exposure to sexually transmitted infections, if they use, you know, if they use protection, fine. But like nothing else, okay? There, in, it, in, it shouldn't unless it serves a specific healing purpose, and that should be up to you. Conversation between you and the therapist that's helping you. Do not ask those sexual questions. Okay, and then the healing process with that foundation of no more contact with the affair, you know, total transparency, containing the negative, you know, dart throwing and making it much more minimal than the positive time you're having together, then you can start building on that. And the process of the therapy with the person who's helping you is really dissecting the relationship. So hopefully taking a history on each of you because a lot of your earlier childhood wounds and your models of how love works and what to expect from love are all coming to play, not only in your relationship dynamics leading up to the affair, but in how you're dealing with the affair now. And so that therapist is gonna help you navigate that and is gonna sort of be a container like the, the like the edges or the banks of the river, right? Like just directing you and containing you and guiding you through the process of not only reconnecting and rebuilding and retrusting, but also navigating how to shift and change things in the relationship in service to healthy communication, connection, emotional intimacy, physical intimacy, right? And maybe you never even really had that to the degree that you're going to have that now that you're working with someone in a really honest and open-hearted way. And it takes time. A lot of it has to do, like I said, with how extreme the betrayal was. You know, if you had a one-night stand, it's going to take less time to repair after that affair than if it was a long-term relationship. But either way, if you are patient, if you are committed, if you are willing to be transparent and you are both willing to do the work that it takes, there is no relationship that not only can't be saved, but can't survive and be better than ever before. In an ideal world, every single one of us goes through, you know, couples therapy before we ever get married or dive into a monogamous relationship. But that is by far the exception, not the rule. And when a catalyst like this happens, like a crisis, you know, the Chinese word for crisis actually means opportunity. And that's honestly what an affair is. It's not that we wish it on you. It's not that we wish it happened. Let me know if you have any questions. I'm always here for you, helping you learn to love and be loved better.